Hello, everyone. We're going to wait a few minutes while people file in here. So good to see everyone joining. I see some friends in there. Hi, Alias, Marcel, Bradley. Hello from Brazil. Where's everybody from? Got Vegas. Very cool. Spain, England, Sao Paulo, I see, Toronto. Okay, it's going kind of fast now. I might not be able to keep up. Quebec, Argentina, all over. This is great. See some SoCals in there. Queens from Russia, Bavaria. We are going to wait a few minutes while people file in. Um, in addition to where you're from, I'd be interested to know what kind of editing uh, people do. Is it professional? Is it casual for fun? Do you make content online? <laughs> Somebody's from Dominaria. <laughs> a lot of YouTube. Very cool. Marketing documentary stuff. Some motion graphics people. Well, this is gonna be fun. I've got a lot of cool advice. I think um, it'll work for people of all skill levels. Hopefully there'll be a tip or two for everybody or more. Marketing for D&D. That's cool, Adam. Gonna wait just a couple more minutes here. Just make sure everybody gets in before we really get started. Thanks everybody for attending. It's exciting. I don't stream much. I'm a little nervous because, uh, you know, live stuff is a little bit different and it doesn't really play to my strengths as an editor, right? I can't edit out my mistakes. So hopefully everybody will uh, bear with me. Yeah, it'll be exciting, Marcel. I hope uh, everybody gets something from this. Hello from Ravnica, Prague. That's very cool. I was in Prague last year. Beautiful, beautiful city. All the way from South Africa. Man, people from all, all over the globe. This is really exciting. All right, we're going to give it one more minute, and then we will begin. Hopefully, if people come in a little bit late, they'll still be able to catch up. It's not going to be something where if you miss the start, you won't get it. Hello from India and Egypt. Uh, this I was told this is going to be being uh, available on demand. It will be recorded, so there will be ways to watch it for those people that um, I know a lot of people were asking on Twitter. Okay, well, I think we can get started here. Um, there's just a couple of little housekeeping things I wanted to let everyone know. If you can change your uh, chat pod settings so that it says all panelists and attendees, that way everyone can see what everyone is saying. So again, go to your chat pod settings and change it to all panelists and attendees. Uh, there are some members of the Adobe team in the chat pod, and they're going to be helping to answer questions as well. Go Ducks, whoever said that. Um, there's going to be a Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. So at the end of the session, I'll be answering the questions that you put into the Q&A pod. So there's a separate chat pod for Q&A. So if you can put your questions in there, the Adobe team will help answer the questions in there that they can, but if there are questions for me at the end, I will go in there and I'll try to answer as many of those questions as we can. Uh, and again, at the end of the session, there's going to be a survey link in the chat pod uh, and it will get emailed to you from Eventbrite. And it'd be great if you could take a minute to fill out the survey that's sent to you because it really does help Adobe uh, plan these events moving forward and make sure that they're doing the best they can. So I guess we'll start here. Um, let me share my screen. So I guess we'll start here with, I should introduce myself. I'm Josh Lee Kwai. Um, I guess I'll give my resume a little bit just so you know why I am someone who you might want to listen to. Uh, I was an editor in the um, movie trailer business for about 15 years. I worked on 
the big movie trailers you see in theaters. I also worked on TV spots and radio spots and everything for movie marketing. Uh, I did work on some bitty, pretty big projects. I worked on stuff like Fast and Furious, Force Awakens. I worked on the first Avengers movie. Uh, I worked for both Disney and Universal. I also worked for some outside vendors, we call them, contractors that do. So that's so why I did stuff for Fox, Sony, a bunch of this, almost all the studios. Uh, I did the Scott Pilgrim versus the World trailer, which people tend to remember. Um, one of the better things I probably ever cut when I was doing uh, movie trailers. Um, so yeah, I've been around for a while. Uh, I've been in the room with just about everybody as far as like directors, actors, heads of studio, had those people sitting behind me as I edited. Uh, Edgar Wright was there a lot of the time when I was doing Scott Pilgrim, which was fun, cool guy. Uh, and then I left Disney uh, a few years ago to start and run a YouTube channel. And the channel is called The Command Zone. Um, we have about, well, 448,000 subscribers. Um, we're a gaming channel focused mostly around, or focused totally around Magic the Gathering, which is a card game you might be familiar with. I know a lot of people in the chat are from the Magic the Gathering community. Um, we do about, I don't know, three to 3.5 million views per month on the YouTube channel. We also um, do some podcast stuff, which have multiple millions of downloads. I don't know the exact number. I think we have like 110 million views total. Uh, we do podcasts, gameplay videos. We have a popular show called Game Nights. Uh, and that's a pretty heavy lift as far as editing, a very heavy lift as far as editing. I'll show you the um, sequence, the timeline, the editing timeline for the latest episode of Game Nights. Looks like this. So we do some pretty, uh, some pretty complicated stuff. And, you know, we really put Premiere through its paces. Re have been really impressed with Premiere and its ability to handle a lot of complexity and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of layers, obviously, and a lot going on. Now, I want to be clear, this timeline that you're looking at, I didn't put this together myself. We have a team of people that work on the show because it's, it's so big. Um, in fact, our team at the Command Zone is about 15 people, and about eight of those are on the editorial staff. So we've got editors, assistants, junior editor types. We also use some freelancers, and of course, that doesn't count myself, and I also will jump in and edit. Um, it's funny because I started a YouTube channel and as being an editor for so long, of course, I, I trained everybody at the beginning to be an editor. Uh, but we have some non-editors now, we have writers and things like that. Um, but over my career, I've trained and mentored a lot of editors. Uh, many of them, almost all of them still work in TVs, movies, commercials, YouTube, you name it. So I don't know everything. Uh, I'd, I'd still say I'm a work in progress and constantly our editors here will do something where I'm like, wait, how'd you do that? Uh, but I've been around the block and you know i've definitely done a lot of editing in a lot of different capacities over the years so um that'll bring us to our main topic here which is the little tricks behind great editing you know as i was looking at webinars uh that adobe has done and similar things and trying to come up with what, what i wanted my topic to to be i noticed that a lot of these types of things tend to be more philosophical in nature and big sweeping generalizations uh those type of lessons are great but you know, one thing I find that's often missing from this type of stuff is like little actionable steps. Like here's a thing you can actually do. And that's what I'm hoping to give you today is some editing hacks, some stuff you can use kind of immediately to, to make a positive change to whatever your next project is. Um, it's basically like a bunch of little tools that you can use to help the way you work. It's really amazing to me how the small things can really add up over time and lead to pretty vast improvements in the quality of your finished product. So before I start, though, I do need to give a little bit of a philosophy. So one of my core editing philosophies is remove impediments to change. So it's kind of like if you think about it this way, in production, when you're actually like shooting the stuff that you're going to edit later, or, you know, often somebody else is shooting that stuff and you're handed it as the editor, but whichever way that goes, we do all kinds of things that are supposed to like make the editorial process easier later down the line. Like the slates, slates in, in movies and stuff are really just for editorial so that it has all the information and everything they need to sync it up and, and know what take it is and stuff. And, or you'll have a script supervisor that will be making notes on the script to kind of tell you, you know, what takes are good and what happened in each one and what parts you might want to use. And 
I think that philosophy can be ported over to when you're editing. So if you create your projects in a way to make changing or altering them later difficult, then as a result, you'll be less likely to change your stuff, right? Because it's hard to do. And which means that you can't really take advantage of all the good ideas you have, because sometimes your ideas are like, oh, but that's going to be really hard to do. And then you'll be less likely to do it. So the philosophy is kind of like, if you miss the opportunity to make your project 1% better, it doesn't seem like a big deal. But what if you miss that opportunity like 5, 10, 20 times on a project? That becomes a pretty big deal, or maybe not in one project, but over the course of many projects, over the course of a long amount of time. So refinement and iteration, I see really as the editor's job. That's a big part of what we're doing. And this, the journey from good to great really isn't like getting twice as good generally. Like if you think of like the fastest person on the planet, you know, Usain Bolt, I think his world record time is like 9.8 or sorry, 9.58 seconds. And like a good high school runner will run at like 10.4 seconds. So there's not a, even a second of difference between the two. It's probably like a 12% difference. And that's the difference between the fastest person who's ever lived and like a good high school runner. So I think those little edges, you know, all my magic players out there will know that like you pile up a lot of little edges and before you know it, you've improved a lot. Um, a big step to that, the, you know, getting 1% better in a few different places is just speed and execution. You know, if something's gonna take you five minutes to do, you're gonna be a lot more willing to do it than if it's gonna take you two hours to do. And so therefore just becoming faster and more efficient at editing tasks uh, or operations, it will raise the overall quality of your finished videos in the end. Um, I often say that really good editors don't always know what to do. They just know what to try and trying a lot of stuff and landing on what it is that you think is the best of those iterations is often how you find the best thing. It's not like a good editor just knows, oh, this is how I solve this problem. A lot of times they know, oh, I'm gonna, I know how to try 10 different things that might solve this problem. Uh, and then I, before I get into the actual tips, I just wanna give a caveat. Yes, I know about things like multicam projects. I know what nests are. They have their places and their use. I'm not gonna be using them today. You won't see them. You're probably gonna have that question on the tip of your tongue. Like, what about multicam project? What about nests? I don't generally prefer them for our workflow here because we have a lot of editors working on one project, uh, but they do have their place, they do have their uses. So yes, I know they exist. You, can, you, you don't have to ask that question. All right, let's go into Premiere now and I can start with the first tip. So here's my Premiere project. So I, I'm, going to use a pretty simple example as we're going through some of these tips today. Uh, this is an ad that we shot for our channel, um, but it starts out with a, a, a skit kind of at the beginning. So we'll cut away. We won't show the entirety of the thing. Don't worry, I'm not going to advertise it to you this whole time. Uh, but it is a good sort of, I think, useful, easy framework for a lot of what we're talking about. Um, hold on, I got to resize some windows that you cannot see. Okay, so this is a pretty simple project that I think a lot of people have, you know, worked and been editing and your project kind of looks like this, right? It's here. I'll, I'll, in fact, let's play it really quick here. And just so you can have an idea so, for what we're starting with. So um, let me make the window a little larger. Sorry, I'm also used to having two monitors. So I might get a little confused about where stuff is. All right. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna play it. Okay. Hey, where's Jimmy been all day? He said he was going to brush up on call time draft by watching the limited resources set reviews. What? Those things go on for hours and hours. I gotta stop him. It might be too late already. Oh, eyes so tired. Screen blurry. Jimmy! Huh? Marshall? LSV, is that you? No, it's Josh. Oh, you've got screen days. You gotta rest your eyes. Okay. Oh, sorry. All right, so that is the little clip we're going to be working with here. Um, poking a little gentle fun at some friends of ours that also make magic content. So looking at this timeline, and I think a lot of people have timelines that look like this, and you can see like there's different clips, and then it goes to the next clip, and it goes to the next clip, and they're all kind of butted up against each other. 
And yeah, there's Marshall. That's exactly what we're talking about. Um, and you can see, you know, it all looks pretty clean and it all looks pretty organized. And I'm going to show you a different method. It's called the stagger method. And I think the important thing to think about here, or one of the philosophies that I consider to be important is that you want your timeline to be organized, but you don't necessarily want your timeline to be clean, if that makes sense. You want more things on your timeline. It's your workstation. And imagine if you're a carpenter or, I don't know, a plumber or whatever, you want your tools at hand. So whenever I see a timeline that is looks like this, I'm thinking, this is actually not optimal. It makes it hard to change stuff. Let's say I wanted... You'll notice when we played this clip, everything's kind of loose. It feels like it takes a while for the next person to say their line. And if I want to tighten stuff up, it can be a little bit tough to do it. You can kind of like move this stuff, but then uh, maybe that was a little too tight and I got to move this back and now I got to lengthen that. And then it's like, okay, I can see on the waveform that there's just too much space there. So I'm going to try and cut that down, but I also want it to go this way. And then I play it. What? And then I go, ah, oh, that maybe that was a little too tight. And now I got to, and it's just a real pain to be moving stuff around in this, in a timeline that looks like this. So I, I recommend something called the, that I call the stagger method. And you're going to notice a couple of things about this new timeline. Uh, right off the bat, you'll notice that I color, uh, color coded the stuff. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But really what I want you to pay attention to is that I took the clips and I staggered them so that within their slot, it's very easy to move them back and forth freely. And this is a really, really good and easy way to find your sweet spots to, real, to be able to um, experiment with timing. Uh, one thing I would say is it's very helpful to go into your keyboard shortcuts and map nudge selection one frame left and nudge selection one frame right. You can put those wherever they make sense for you. I put them on the greater than and less than keys because those kind of make arrows that point left and right, but you can put them wherever you want. But being able to nudge the, the selection a frame here and there will really help you be able to find, again, your sweet spots. And this really allows you to tighten up stuff or loosen up as you need to very, very easily and quickly. And so I'm gonna go through here real quick and I'm gonna just try and get this cut tighter than it was. And if we look at our first um, timeline that was real clean, we can see that it's about 20. If you look right here, I'll mark the whole clip and it'll tell you that this is about 26 seconds long. So let's see what we can get it down to here with the stagger method. So I can already tell like with the waveform, I probably want to cut into that later. Okay. All right, now let's tighten this. And again, I, I'm going to look at the waveforms, but I'm also going to you know, listen to each each moment where the cuts happen and see if I'm making it too tight or it's still a little bit loose or if it's where I want it to be. And I'm notice I'm not gonna worry about picture yet because once that sounds good, it's pretty easy to make it look good. Where's Jimmy been all day? He said he was gonna... So that might be a little tight. Let's try again. Hey, where's Jimmy been all day? He said he was gonna brush up on call time draft by watching the limited resources set reviews. So notice too that this method allows you to do something that is how normal conversation goes. So in normal conversation in real life, if you're talking to a person, generally we don't like wait for a pause in between them talking before we start talking. The way that human communication works, we can kind of tell that their thought or their sentence is coming to an end. They start to come down a little bit. And people will often like start to say what they're gonna say, even over the top of kind of the end of the last word that somebody else just said. And that's very hard to do when your timeline is like this. But when your timeline is staggered, you can now create that. But also, if you do that, if you were to have, you know, this person, uh, Jake here, start to talk when I'm not done talking on this timeline, it'll just cut off my audio and it'll just go away. But that's not how sound works. Sound in a real environment would sort of ring out and you would still be able to hear, you know, the tail end of what I'm saying, even though Jake has started to talk. And so this allows you to make your conversation sound more like how conversations really sound resources set reviews what those things go so i'm just resources set reviews what those things go on for hours and hours i gotta stop it it might be too late already all right so that door so there's another thing here which i'm going to point out which is i've already pulled it but because i move away from the microphone as i'm saying this the sound gets a little weird so what we did is we recorded that sound wild later and i just pre-timed it so it'd be easy 
Um, it doesn't quite exactly fit into my mouth as far as like, it looks slightly out of sync. So we'll have to worry about covering that later. But again, sounds more important than video at this point. Of course, I gotta stop him. It might be too late already. So that seems like a big pause. So we're gonna see how far we can push this where it looks realistic that I could have moved in front. Of course, I gotta stop him. It might be too late already. Something like that looks fine. Then this is a way where like, you know, Jake has kind of a funny shrug here to me, like, hey, what are you, where are you going? Stop him. It might be too late already. So I want that, right? Because it's kind of a funny moment, but also like, I don't want just a pause in the audio where it's just like, we got to wait for this little joke to play out before we hear Jimmy talking. So we'll do a little bit of a J cut where we hear Jimmy, even though we're still seeing Jake. And I think that's hopefully going to work. Too late already. Oh, eyes so tired. Screen blurry. So I feel like this can be pretty tight for my next line. Blurry. Jimmy. Huh? Again, we can tighten this up. Blurry. Jimmy. Huh? Marshall? LSV, is that you? So I think we can already tell how the stagger method just made it very easy for us to tighten all this stuff up. And it also makes it very easy as we're going. Like, I'm doing this pretty fast and pretty rough. You're still going to have the ability to, you know, move this in its spot as much as you want to find the sweet spot as you go forward and, and editing kind of works like that where like the first rough cut you don't really think about too much just throw your stuff in the timeline you're just kind of get an idea for the whole thing and then later you're like okay well i'm going to concentrate on this moment and really refine it and finesse it and by the end you've gone every over everything with a um fine tooth comb and you get to the part of the process where you are really like messing with singular frames and this allows you along every part of that process to really do that and so we took something that was 26 seconds and just by doing that we cut it down to 22 13 so we cut almost we cut three and a half seconds out of it which i think is pretty good for general tightening we could probably do a little bit more but that'll kind of get us through the stagger method another thing i like about it and also you don't have to leave it here right so like maybe i want to hang on jake here at this moment so i sort of hear josh me say what and then we cut to me maybe that'll feel good okay. He said he was going to brush up on call time draft by watching the limited resources set reviews. What? Those things go on for hours and hours. I got to stop him. It might be too late already. Ugh, eyes. So I think a lot of uh, a common pitfall of like um, beginning editing or novice editors is you get into this cadence where it's like somebody talks, camera's on them. The next person starts to talk. As soon as they start to talk, the camera cuts to them. Cut back to the person talking, you know, the next person talking. And it really gets monotonous. It's kind of like a metronome can hypnotize the audience. And so having some moments where you start to hear the next person talk, but you haven't cut to them yet, uh, is a way to sort of smooth out your editing. Because if you think about editing as uh, moments where you can snap the audience out of the illusion of what's happening. If two things happen at once, it's more way more likely to um, draw attention to itself. So a cut on sound and video at the same time can often be jarring and call attention to itself. Whereas if it's like, oh, I start to hear something and then a beat later, I see the video change to the next thing can be a, a way to sort of smooth out, especially dialogue scenes. Uh, and if you watch movies and TV all the time, you'll see that they do not just cut to person talking, then cut to next person talking, then cut to person talking. They linger on somebody while the other person starts or maybe even through their whole line. They, they cut to somebody when they're not talking. So yeah, it's J cuts and L cuts. Um, not just between scenes, but between shots within a scene. And stagger method definitely sort of already puts you in that mode, which is another thing I like about it. Um, so the, the next thing I wanted to talk about as a tip is related to the stagger method, and I sort of alluded to it earlier, it's be frame accurate. And I was talking about the different processes or the different um, stages of editing. And you know, when you're in the refinement stage near the end, or you're working on a scene and it's getting really close to done. I think there's a tendency among novice and beginning editors to sort of not take the time to really find the exact frame that you want to land on. So what I would do, what my philosophy is push it too far in whatever direction you're going until you cross the line. And now you know where the line is and you can pull back from there rather than, so like if I want to make, you know, if I want to find the, the earliest moment I could have Jake, who's the yellow um, clip here, start talking once the blue clip, me, is done, then I really want to find that exact frame. So I can mess with it with the stagger method and using nudge one right or one left to really find that frame. So I'm going to listen to it here. Where's Jimmy been all day? He said he was going to... 
So that feels close, but I don't know. Is that as close as I could get it where it would still feel realistic? Let's move it forward three frames and see. Hey, where's Jimmy been all day? He said he was going to. Maybe. Okay. Hey, where's Jimmy been all day? He said he was going to. It feels slightly tight, but I'm going to go two left uh, just to see. Okay. Hey, where's Jimmy been all day? He said he was going to brush up. So that's so tight that it feels like Jake is responding to the question before he could have realistically absorbed the question and been answering it, right? So now I definitely know we're somewhere around two to three frames. And now I'm going to look for the exact frame I want. Where's Jimmy been all day? He said he was going to brush up. Feels pretty good. I'm going to move it one right and see how that feels. Okay. Hey, where's Jimmy been all day? He said he was going to brush up on call time draft by watching the limited resources set reviews. What? So I think taking that part of the process, I think that's the correct frame. Now it's everybody's going to have their own um, their own barometer of what the frame is. But it, as long as you've said, okay, I found the exact frame I want for this. And that is the that is a really important step of the process. Do not settle for, oh, it's probably right. It's about right. It's about, no, find your frame. Get down to the point where you are on the frame you want to be on for every edit in the thing. That's how you make your stuff great. Um, one caution I want to say about the stagger method and it is that in real life in a conversation if jake's talking and i'm talking we can overlap each other but the same is not true for if i'm the only one talking so if there's a monologue a long speech uh if it's a corporate video and somebody's saying a lot of things you have to be a little careful with the stagger method because you do not want a person to overlap with themselves that's just not something that can happen in nature right like i can't be talking and then my voice comes over the top of my own voice so that's really going to draw attention to the editing and you so when you're using the stagger method and you are um uh working with like let's say just for the sake of it that it went like this right where i talked and then i talked again where's jimmy been all day what those things go on for you have to be real careful not to overlap those Where's Jimmy been all day? What? Those things. And you, it's it, it, it can be a real tight thing because a lot of times you want those to be as tight as possible, but you you need to leave a little bit of a beat sometimes just to make it sound realistic. So just watch out for that. Okay, let's talk about tip number three. Could be funny though. Yes, I mean if that's a if that's an effect you're going for uh, there, Wayne, then maybe you would want to do it, but just don't do it on accident is all I'm saying. All right. Tip number three is see it on the timeline. And this is where we're going to talk about the color coding that I did. And we're also going to talk about, um, organizing your tracks, which are both very important things. So the color coding, I think it's pretty obvious that I color coded, you know, here's me, yellow is Jake, red is Jimmy. And then I actually have a second setup because I move locations and I did that in purple. And this is just a way that on the timeline, I can see what everything is. And, you know, we call it reading the matrix, you know, in the matrix when uh, the they're looking at just the code and they can still tell what's happening. It's very useful to be able to do that with your timeline, but it's very hard to do that if your timeline looks like this. Then it's easy to be like, okay, which one's Jake here? Uh, it's probably that one, no, it's this one. So then it just becomes harder to find things and harder to move around your timeline really quickly. So. Color coding is very, very important. It'll just make you move around and know what you're doing faster. It'll make everything clearer to you. Things are easier to find. So let's talk about the second part of this. And, and for this, I'm going to go to our um, a different timeline, a different sequence, which was four game nights, our big um, complicated show. And I'm going to use that as an example just because it works a little bit better here. So here we've got a big complicated timeline. In fact, I'm going to pull this out and just let it be let it take over the screen here. All right, so here's a Game Nights timeline, just a piece of it, because it would take too, too long to load if it was the whole thing. So this is a, what is that? This is a 21 minute chunk of Game Nights. So what we've done, you can see we've color coded, but also we have organized our tracks and you can kind of see what it means uh, or how the tracks are laid out. So our first four track, I should go back. This show has basically two locations. There's a location where we're at the table playing the game. And then there is a location where we are in sort of an interview style setup, a confessional interview. That's not a great picture of me. I shouldn't show that. Uh, a confessional style interview setup. 
And so there's two types of dialogue. And so for those two types of dialogue, we assign each four channels uh, because so we can do the stagger method. And we do, we actually do double audio channels because we have multiple microphones and it's a mixed thing I'm not going to go into here. But so for the first four channels, these ones here, uh, that is the interview dialogue. And it makes it real easy to tell if I just do it this way. And then for channels five, six, seven, and eight, that is the in-game dialogue. And then we do sound effects on channels nine through 20. And then normally by the end, we would have, this is still a, uh, I took an old project that was in progress. But so nine through 12, or sorry, nine, nine through 20 are sound effects. And then normally we would have uh, two music layers, maybe four, 21 through 24 would be the music layers. Usually we can get away with two because you don't tend to layer a bunch of music on top of itself. Um, how long does a 21 minute section like this take to edit? Uh, I don't know, a long time. Probably this is, a well, it's multiple people, so it's hard to sort of pull it around 24 hours. Yeah, right. Uh, it's probably like a week and a half, I would say. This has animations and everything, so it's it's a lot. Um, so without the animations and stuff, I would say 20 minutes is probably a good 50, 60 hours worth of work. I don't know. I haven't broken it down that way before. Um, so let me go back to seeing it on the timeline. So seeing your stuff on the timeline, because once your timelines get more complicated, being able to immediately tell what's what, where things are probably at. If you listen to things and you're like, you hear something, at least you have a good chance of being able to find it if you've laid out your tracks and you know, A1 A through four is this, A5 through eight is this. Okay, I can I know the section of the timeline to look in to find the thing that I need to change. And it's so important for being able to edit quickly because the more time that you spend kind of like figuring out where stuff is, is less time you're actually fixing the problem. And that causes that, that thought in your head of like, this is tedious or this is gonna be hard, that's gonna get in the way of you actually making the change that's gonna make your project better. Um, also, I think people think, well, I'm the only one working on this project, so I can put things wherever I want because I'll remember later. And I mean, we all know that that's kind of not true depending on the size of the project. It's so easy to be like, uh, you pick up the project again, whether it's a big project or you just couldn't work on it for a few days and you come back and you're like, you put the sound effects where dialogues are and the music where other sound effects might be. And then all of a sudden it's really, really hard to figure out where stuff is. And it also makes it really easy to do things like, let's say I just wanted to turn up. I just said, uh, all the in-game dialogue is low. It's so easy to just select it all, bring up my gain tool and bring it up. You know, I can just sort of do things like that that are harder to do if I've got other things mixed in with my tracks. If my music is mixed, oh, it's calculating audio peaks. Okay, don't worry, I'm not actually going to up the gain. Uh, it's really a lot harder to do things like that, to just select big chunks and do things when you've got your music and your sound effects mixed in with your dialogue. So separating it all and organizing it will really help you um, make changes quickly and know where to find things and things like that. Uh, you'll see that we also just layer all of our takes into the timeline. And again, I know multicam and everything works and how it's set up, but we do find it very easy to just like, okay, well, what if I want to see what that sh shot looks like there? I just bring it up. What if I want to see this shot instead? Okay, I do that. So, and it also means that when I give my cut to another editor, and I know this is not something that a lot of people are dealing with, multiple editors working on the same project, but they know because we all use the same system how to take my edit and it immediately makes sense to them. So organizing very, very important in a lot of ways. Okay, let's go on to the next, what tip are we on? Four? I don't know, uh, 1230? I think we're doing okay here time-wise. Okay, the next tip is organize and watch all of your footage. I am shocked constantly by how rare this actually is you'd think that this would be editing 101. It was something I was taught early on. I had a mentor that said, listen, you cannot, you cannot um, always decide when you're gonna have brilliant I ideas strike you. But what you can do is know all your footage really, really well so that you have the best chance that those connections can happen. And I think a lot, a lot of us, especially in YouTube and the, the online content creation space, we're, we're wearing a lot of hats. And so like, 
you're involved in shooting the footage and you maybe probably wrote the footage and now you're editing the footage and you think you can make shortcuts because, well, I was there when it got shot. So I know this is the best take. And you don't even, I, I, we're all guilty of this, right? You're just like the last take. I know that's the best take. I'm going to put that in the timeline. And really after I loaded in the footage, I didn't even really watch takes one, two, and three. I just went straight to four, thought it was the best one. And I put that into my cut. And I think that like, you are missing some sort of percentage points when you do that. You don't know when you shoot everything else that you shot and how that was going to all turn out. You don't know, is that the best take? So many things change once you get it in and you're looking at it in the context of the other pieces of the puzzle that are next to it or happened two minutes before it or two minutes after it. And so it's really, really important, I think, to watch all your footage and organize it because the act of organizing it actually helps cement it in your brain, right? They've done all these research about recall and memory. And one of the great ways to sort of remember things over the long term is to have multiple inputs. So you see it, you write it down, you hear it. Those would be three ways that it comes in your brain and you're much more likely to hold the information than if you only saw it or only heard it. So let's look at how I synced up and organized and watched all the footage for the, um, the little skit video that we talked about earlier. So there are four setups. There's me at the desk, Jake at the camera, Jimmy at the couch, and then me in the doorway. So I synced up the footage and then I made markers for, and I'm gonna say, first of all, this is a pretty simple scene. So I, I think some of these tools specifically won't work when the project is more complicated. But uh, I'm gonna give you these as for what I use for this project. You might be creating bins and folders and subclips and things like that uh, over in the project window here for very complicated projects, you know. Uh, but on something like this, which I think is probably more akin to what most people are doing, you can you can sort of build it in this way. So I synced up the whole thing, and then I put a red marker on the first line from me. So all the red markers are the first line from me, which is okay. Hey, where's Jimmy been all day? So I can easily find take two. Okay. Hey, where's Jimmy been all day? Take three. Okay. Hey, where's Jimmy been all day? And so on and so forth. But I also then put, I only have two lines in this scene or in this setup. And I then I put, I marked the second line with the orange marker. Wait, what? Those things go on for hours and hours. I got to stop him. What? Those things go on for hours and hours. I got to stop him. What? Those things go on for hours and hours. Oh, damn it. That was a false take, but I still marked it because maybe I want to just use the first half of it. And then what I did is I went down and you can see, I actually, I actually razor tooled the takes and brought them up a layer so that I will we'll easily be able to grab them and get to them if I need to. And then I went a step further and I actually pulled the takes out and put them back to back to back. So it would be easy for me to just watch them all. So if I wanted to watch all six takes, it's 21 seconds, so we can just watch them. Okay. Hey, where's Jimmy been all day? 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 So I've got take one through six right there. And then you'll see, I actually did a little hierarchy where I pulled uh, the one I like the most up to the video layer three and the one I like the second most up to video layer two and I actually wrote some little notes. So this one's quicker and this one's longer just so that I would know later, you know, that I have those options and those are the ones I like. But I also, you know, I'd never know until I'm in the middle of the edit or pretty far down the road if I may, I may use one of these takes that I, initially I thought wasn't great. And until I have watched and put all that information into my head, there's no way for me to contextualize that decision in a way that's responsible, right? If you haven't seen the takes that you're not using, then you can't, uh, you can't use them, right? You don't know they exist. So I did this for everybody. You can see, took Jake's takes. Jimmy's here. Everyone's ask, people are asking where Jimmy, here, here he is. Um, and I organized the takes in that same way for everything. So very, very important. I think a lot of people are being lazy about this and you know you are. You shoot the stuff, watch all the stuff, mark all the stuff, organize the stuff. That process alone will tell you, will download all the information you need in your brain so that when you're in here actually editing it, you go, oh, but there was that one take where this happened and it actually might work better because whatever, right? You can't make that connection if you didn't watch all this stuff. 
So make sure you watch the stuff, you organize the stuff. Okay, let's go on to tip number five, which is use multiple sequences. So I'm gonna do another thing here where I'm gonna build something over on this monitor you can't see, and then we will look at it. So you notice that I'm not using the source window much. So you can have the source window open over here and you can drag stuff in this way from your source window into your uh, project timeline. And I'm not doing that much. I'm actually going from another sequence and bringing that into the sequence that I'm uh, working on. So it's really useful and important, I guess. Uh, I find this just to be a lot more efficient way to work than going from your source window in. There are times when the source window works and it's the right way to go. But in general, uh, I'm a fan of um, pulling from sequence to sequence. And so one way we do this is we put multiple sequences uh, on screen at the same time. Hold on, I'm putting something together here just so I can show it to you all. Um, just to make it easier to get from A to B. So if you stack your sequences kind of like this, and now you see I've got my organized clips with all my takes marked out up here, and I have the sequence that I'm working out of down here. And if you have two monitors, which I would encourage people to do, you can have you know, your video over on the other monitor so you can still see what's going on when you click on stuff. Um, we're just gonna make it work this way for now. Uh, but you can now drag your takes directly from one to the other and kind of put them in. And I remember there was a take, yeah, of Jake laughing at the end of his line that I kind of liked. And I might try to put that in instead of what I've got. So let's listen to Jake here. And he gives a little chuckle at the end, which maybe makes the joke land a little bit better. He said he was going to brush up on call time draft by watching the limited resources set reviews. I like that little smile and that it's like a slight chuckle that Jake gives at the end. And I don't think I'm using that take right now. So an easy way to bring this in is just to copy and paste it into this timeline. And you can do it in two ways. You can either overwrite what you've already got, or you can disable what you've got. Or you can do it here too, by right clicking and going to enable disable and copy and paste the new clip in. So there's the new clip from Jake and uh, turn him up a little. So he's in the same volume and now I can just test this out and uh, you know, we're going to mess with timing or whatever we like it, but I'll just loosely throw it in there and see if I like it better than it was there before. So let's play this. Okay. Hey, where's Jimmy been all day? He said he was going to brush up on call time draft by watching the limited resources set reviews. What? Those things go on for. And I do like that little chuckle from Jake. So, you know, that's something that I might keep or might think about keeping. But you can see how moving between sequences is a little bit, I think, easier and cleaner than moving from your source window uh, because it allows you to really see the marks. And I can see things like the layers and the color uh, coding that I've done when I bring it into my project sequence. Uh, and also using multiple sequence can mean copying your sequence more often and keeping sort of backup or old old decision trees, let's call them. So let's say that, I'm gonna move this aside. Let's say that this, here's that, here's that sequence we just created that has the two options for Jake, Jake's line here. Now let's say that I wasn't sure if I liked one more than the other. So what can I do about that? Uh, how do I make sure that as I move forward in the process, I, didn't, I don't lose something that I liked? Well, I'm just all the time doing this and I, I don't know if everybody does it. I, I, I feel like my guys don't do it as much as I do, or my team doesn't do it as much as I do. I just will duplicate the sequence and make me in O2 or maybe like a O1 alt and I'll call this one O1. And now I always have that line, no matter what I decide later. So that if, if tomorrow I watch this thing and I decide, you know what? I, li I did like that old version of the line better. I, I can easily find it. It's already kind of in the space where it was supposed to be. Don't be afraid to make too many sequences. Sequences don't take up a lot of space in your project. So it's, you know, I will often have a bunch of sequences and I'll even create like a folder that's like too much LR. That's the name of the project, Marshall. That's for you. Um, old cuts. And then I might take this and put it into my old cuts folder just to kind of keep my project still clean. But I can always go back and look at my old cuts and be like, find stuff that I, I thought I didn't like, but then decided that I did. 
And that's another way to make your project better, right? If you're always just like, every time you update something, you've always made it better. Well, you weren't doing the frame accurate thing, right? You didn't go too far and be like, oh, I actually made it worse. So let's go back. You should be doing that sometimes in your process. Otherwise, I don't think you're probably iterating quite enough. All right, let's go to tip number six. So you see me moving around the timeline a lot. Um, there's something called the TQ trick. And it's super, super useful for moving around your timeline very quickly. So this is going to be a keyboard shortcut um, trick. And if you've got paper or pen or whatever in front of you, uh, this is one of the ones I might think about writing down. Um, okay, hold on one second here. Okay, so there are five keys here, Q-W-E-R-T. You don't have to put this on those keys. This is uh, where how I learned them, and that's why I put them there. The most important one I put on T is called Mark Selection. And what this does is when you select a clip, so you click on it, if you hit T, which is now Mark Selection, it will make an in point and an out point at the very start and the very end of that clip. Right, so anything I click on, I can hit T and put a mark at the very in and the very out of that clip. And then, uh, sorry, I lost my chat and I'm looking for it and I don't know how to find it, which is why I'm thinking here. <laughs> I minimized it and I don't know where it went. Okay, it's okay, we'll figure it out later. Uh, so you've got the, the T, uh, that's marking the selection. So anything you select, you hit T and it will make an in point and out point where that is. And the next part of this process is that you go back to your keyboard shortcuts and you map to Q and W, either go to in and go to out. So go to in point, go to out point or go to in, go to out. So now if I click on a clip and I want to go to the start of that clip, I hit T and then I hit Q, which goes to the in point, which is this point or I hit W, which goes to the out point, which is that point. And I can either say, I wanna pull, so it's very easy to move to a certain point without like clicking and finding exactly, because this is not very accurate. When you click on the timeline, you're liable to be in the middle of a clip or whatever, but I wanna be right at the start of that one. Okay, really easy to get there. T, Q, and I go to it. And then this also works really, really well if you combine it with the last part of this puzzle. So you're on your shortcuts on E and R, you wanna place, mark in and mark out so that gives you the ability to manually place the in and out point so if i hit the the keyboard e now to mark in it's going to place a mark there and then out to mark out will place a mark there and i can always get back to the those points with my q and my w so often when i'm like showing things to clients or whatever i would put an in point at the very start of the cut so we'll be messing around with stuff whatever and then later they're like okay play it i just hit q and then hit play and i'm right back at the start or anytime I'm messing with something and I know like once I'm done messing with it, I'm gonna wanna play it from here, I can put a mark there and I can always find that point. It also is really convenient for what we just did. So we just changed out that one line from Jake and we wanna know if we like it better than the old line. And what I can do is I can create two versions on my timeline of this moment. I've got a mark point here and a mark point there, right? And with my Q and my W, I'm able to just move between them very quickly. And so what I can do is I can play version number one. Where's Jimmy been all day? He said he was gonna brush up on call time draft by watching the limited resources set reviews. What? And a very easy play version number two right afterwards. Where's Jimmy been all day? He said he was gonna brush up on call time draft by watching the limited resources set reviews. So one. Where's Jimmy been all day? He said he was gonna brush up on call time draft by watching the limited resources set reviews. Where's Jimmy been all day? He said he was gonna brush up on call time draft by watching the limited resources set reviews. What? Those things go on for hours and hours. I gotta stop. All right, so by using that trick, you can move quickly through the timeline and it allows you to do things like compare apples to apples side by side and really make a better decision. Uh, Cause I find it so much easier to tell if something's better if I can watch it really closely back to back a few times. And then I kind of get an inkling where I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards, you know, this take or that take over the other. All right, let's move on to the next one, which is, oh, we're, we're now we're officially behind. And uh, I don't know, um, I'm on tip seven and we've only got 10 minutes left. Jeez, what happened? Okay, uh, tip seven is be a surgeon. I'll try and go quickly. This is a thing I see a lot from people. 
how do surgeons operate on people? What's the first step? They slice them open. What's the second step? They make the fixes. What's the third step? They stitch them up. I think a lot of people, when they're making fixes to a complicated timeline, they want to worry about stitching up while they're doing the fixes. That's not the way to go. So let's imagine this timeline I'm looking at, and I want to make changes in this section. And easy, the easiest way to do it is to make an, a slice through my whole timeline with the razor tool somewhere down here. And then I can now select everything and just give myself some space. This is the surgeon making the cut and opening up. And now I can make all my changes in here. So let's say I'm like, I don't know, I want, you know, I want that line to be longer and I want to do all this stuff and I want to move it around and, you know, put another line in there or whatever. I'm doing it messy, but, and now I've made my change and I, but I know this always connects to this. And so it's a lot easier for me to now at the end of it, stitch it up. And then I just connect those two points and we're back to where we were. Don't worry about while you're making changes to the middle, stitching up as you go, right? Create a big chunk of space, make your changes, grab everything. Now put it back together, stitch it up. All right, let's go to tip number eight so I can hopefully get through all of these. Okay, I'm gonna try something really quick. I'm gonna, oh, I found my chat screen. There it is. Okay. Uh, all right. Two more, we can do this. The history window. All right, here we are. Notice how I've got my history window open. We've all done that thing where we're editing and we hit a button and somewhere in there and we don't know what the button is and something happened to our timeline somewhere. And oh my gosh, what did I do? There is a window called history. And if you go window history, it'll open up and it'll look like this and it'll tell you all your actions. And so two things you can do we can go for 15 minutes after the hour. Oh, thank you, Emily. Okay, so we're gonna go a little long. I don't have to talk so fast. Thank you. Um, so what you can do is you can have your history open or you can open it at that point and look through and find the thing is like, you know, enable items. I didn't mean to enable items. Let's go find that moment and I'll fix that. And now I know what happened. Another really good trick to get away from accidentally uh, doing stuff is go and open your keyboard shortcuts and look at all the, the like go to in, go to out, mark in, mark out, mark selection, slip tool, slip uh, slide tool. Look at all of those. And the ones that you don't know what they are, blow them away. Get them out of there. Because they're only buttons you're going to hit that are going to do stuff you, doesn't, you don't want to do, right? Because you don't even know what they are. And you can add them once you figure out what they are. But take the buttons off your tooltip that you don't know what they do. Because those are the ones that are going to cause you huge problems because you're going to accidentally hit you when you meant to hit, you know, shift Y or something, and you're gonna be like, what, I don't even know what that did. And it's, you know, that can happen. And you can find out if you were zoomed in an hour or two in, and it's like, oh, I did something later in the timeline. I don't even know what happened. So just unmap that stuff, take it off your keyboard so that you don't, you don't uh, get yourself in a situation where it's hard to get out of. Okay, I got two more tips. And these are a little bit different than the other tips in that they're more specific. I wanted to give some like actionable hacks that are useful in specific situations. So let's talk about tip number nine, which is fade to black video. So on our show, we do a lot of layering of images um, sort of windowed. So I just put this together really quickly. This is just me, two photos on a background. I've got a little scaling going on. I put a little drop shadow on them and they are sort of simply moving. And if you get into a situation where you try and dissolve this to black, watch what happens. See how it's it doesn't work very well. The shot of me shaking someone's hand is in front of everything else, but as the dissolve happens, it all starts to dissolve. And now we start to see the outline of the photo underneath. And we even start to see the background peek through behind the two photos. And anybody who's worked with layering has probably run into this issue where it's kind of tough to fade to black. Uh, when you've got a lot of layers going on and a really easy fix for this is you just instead of fading uh cross fading down to what is filler down here you actually create black video and fade up to black rather than down to nothing so if you go to file new and go black video it'll create black video which if you drag it in your timeline this is just black video right so this is just black so if i put it over here it'll be picture 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 black so now you just create black at the size you want it to be. 
So I've got 20 frames of black here. And instead of fading down to black, I fade up to black. So this is gonna go up to black. And now you see it doesn't peek through in the way that it was before. It just goes to a pure black. You can also, this is the cheap way, right? You can also go into your effects palette and you can set your keyframes and go from zero to a hundred. And you can also set your blend mode and you can play around. And there are, <laughs> if you don't know, there are a lot of ways to fade to black and a lot of ways to score and make it smoother and or different than you knew. So this black video trick, I, I see a lot of people being like, oh crap. Yeah, this is a thing that I think a lot of editors run into and don't know how to fix. And this is just an easy, easy way to fix it. All right, let's talk about one more that I hope will be just as cool. And this is a music editing trick that I've used for years and years. Um, so this is the final version we ended up with for the skit that we've been messing around with this whole time. So I'll play it for you real quick. Okay. Hey, where's Jimmy been all day? He said he was gonna brush up on call time draft by watching the limited resources set reviews. What? Those things go on for hours and hours. I gotta stop him. It might be too late already. Ugh, eyes so tired. Screen blurry. Jimmy! Huh? Marshall? LSV, is that you? No, it's Josh. Oh, uh, you've got screen days. You gotta rest your eyes. All right. Okay. All right, so that's kind of where we ended up, uh, you know, as so we put some additional effects on. But the big thing is we put some music in here. And as I'm listening to the music, I'm sort of wishing that the music would change or maybe stop when we change environments. It just might be nice when I move to the other room to have the tone of the thing change. So in order to create a music stop, and let's listen to the music only here. So there's that nice downbeat. Do -do -do -do. So I'm going to cut out on that downbeat. Let's listen to it. Now, it might be hard to hear because we're just kind of playing through speakers and you're listening to my microphone. But when you clip off audio like that, it often sounds clipped off. It doesn't ring out into the room the same way that like if somebody with a guitar hit one note on the guitar, it would reverb out into the room and you would hear it ring out, right? Whereas when an audio clip just ends like this, it just goes to silence and it feels kind of weird. You can feel the absence of that ring out. So here's a cool trick that will help with these moments when you're editing your music. You select your last beat. So you find the, the head of the beat. Let's say there. And then you put a mark in point with your E. And then you mark your out point far into the silence. All this. You want a bunch of silence. And now we're going to bring up our media tool and we're going to output this clip. Notice I've soloed out just my music. So I'm going to export an AIF just because it's high quality. Uh, of just, you'll see, it'll just give us this one beat and then a bunch of silence. So you'll end up with an audio clip that is one note and then a whole ton of empty space at the end, which is exactly what we want. So I'm going to export this as, let's just call it music stop. All right, we'll export that clip. And then we'll open that in our finder window and we'll bring that clip back in. So now you'll be able to see the waveform when I open it up. It's that one note and a bunch of silence, right? So now I've cut that in and I have my, out, my in point set. So it's gonna time up exactly, and there it is. And now if I go to my effects tool and I type in reverb, I can drop a studio reverb on that thing. Well, let's, let me play it first without, again, I wish the audio was a little better, but we'll try here. So I've got that, but if I drop a studio reverb on this thing, what it's gonna do is it's gonna create an echo on it. And you can use the presets. Yeah, listen, you can find a tutorial about how reverb works and you can mess with it if you want. In general, I find the presets are pretty good. And for music, you want either drum large or vocal large. And now when you play it, the music will naturally kind of echo out and ring out because that's what's doing, it's adding reverb. So hopefully this will work with the mic, I'm not sure. So you get that nice ring out. And now you combine that with the music. I'll give it a slight fade at the start, just a couple of frames, and you get a nice natural sounding stop. Already. Oh, sorry, let me just solo only the music. All right, well, we heard it, it sounded a little double there. Let me try again. Ah, oh, there it is. 
Okay, try that one more time. And now you get like a real nice ring out and your music stop actually doesn't sound clipped off. It sounds like the musician hit that last note and let it ring off into the distance. So there you go. Those are my top 10 tips. Oh, I forgot to change the tip name on the last one. I was doing so good. There it is, music stop and reverb trick. All right. <laughs> okay, so, well, oh. I need to increase my mic. Did it get lower? Okay, sorry. I think I just was far away from it. My bad, my bad. I'll be right on top of it. Uh, okay, so now uh, those are my tips. I hope they were helpful to everyone. And now I will open up the Q&A and I will try and answer some of these questions. And I think I'll stop sharing my screen so that you can see me. Hopefully that works. Okay, let's go through the Q&A here. This is the part I'm most nervous about because I don't know how any of this works. All right. Um, what kind of computer, how much space do you need to have that big of an editing project? For the game night stuff, for the really big stuff, you need pretty top of the line stuff. And we have a server that has seven, uh, 68 terabytes worth of space. You don't need that for any given project, but you need that um, if you're going to have many of them. I'd say the average game nights project is with the raw footage and everything is like seven terabytes now. Um, and we can consolidate that down after we color the footage and stuff down to about a couple of terabytes, but still very large. Uh, Jacob asks, where and how did you get your big break as an editor? Uh, I started uh, as an entry level person at a post production house, like the person making coffee and like delivering stuff. And at night I would work on, um, they, they had the computers and nobody was using a lot of them at night. And so I would just cut my own stuff and then show it to people. And eventually they were like, hey, this stuff's pretty good. Well, why don't we promote you? And I kind of worked my way up that year or that way. My big break was I cut the trailer for a movie called Evan Almighty, which was um, the sequel to Bruce Almighty. And that, uh, yeah, in the movie trailer world, if you cut a trailer for a big movie, they'll kind of ask you to do that more and more often. And that's kind of how I moved down the road towards eventually Star Wars, I guess. Um, Lucas asks, what is the biggest tip you wish you knew when you were starting the command zone? Um, as far as editing, I don't know if there's a really big tip. I, I, like I said, I've been editing for 15 years when I got to that point. Although my experience editing with many people working on the same project was not super robust. I'd done a little bit of documentary work and some other stuff, but I think I, I group workflows would have been something that um, I wish I knew a little bit more about when we started. We've muddled our way through and landed somewhere. And I, you know, subsequently I, I learned to you know, ask people who did know and, and learned a lot that way. Uh, but I probably would have asked a little earlier. Um, Rob asks, how often do you find yourself color correcting? Do you find onset lighting makes for a better feel to the video rather than correct color correcting in post? We color correct everything here. So we shoot everything flat. I think that the thing is onset lighting and color correcting in camera can be good. You just need to know which one you're doing at the start because what you don't want to do is shoot thinking you're not going to color correct and then color correct later. Because you you shoot footage totally differently when you know you're going to color, color correct than when you don't. Uh, so that I think that's kind of the most important thing there is just choosing one early. Because, man, you do not want to switch thinking like, oh, we we're going to color correct this. And then you get it in and you're like, actually, we're not. Well, that's not going to look good. Um, let's see. Yeah, answer live, answer live. Okay. okay. Oh, I should click answer live as I'm answering it so that people know which question I'm answering. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, Daniel Woodling. Hey, Daniel. Daniel's done a little bit of work for us on some projects. Um, he asked, how do you handle working on a project with a large team? Do you break up by in, uh, in, into sequences and then pull them all together at the end with everyone working on one file or something? Um, it, it changes. So working with a team is complicated, but there are basically like um, stages. And in the early stages, you assign certain parts of the episodes to every member of the team. And the team has to be sure to communicate and we sometimes have some meetings talking about story arcs and things like that like that because it's like hey in your section you need to plant the seeds for this story and in your section you need to make sure you're paying it off but then later we kind of start to stitch all that stuff together and that is when you know you kind of be a little more free flowing of like okay we're putting these two parts together and these two parts together and we're going to shift assignments of who's doing what and so i wouldn't say that there's any uh that it's always the same. It just kind of shifts as you go. And, and every episode is different because arcs 
are different. So on game nights, maybe there's a, a one long story arc, but there might be two or three little ones. And depending on how that all uh, shakes out, we, we assign uh, things differently because of that. All right, let's go to Karen. Um, what tips can you provide regarding the best Kodaks to work for faster edits on giant projects, also working with proxies? All right, Karen. Uh, this is the outside of the realm of what I'm really good at. Um, we have guys, on, a guy on staff here, Jake, who knows a lot more about it than I do. Uh, this is like the super technical side of stuff. We work mostly in uh, H.264 and MP4s and stuff like that. But I know, depending on the amount of sizes and space you have available on your servers, there are ways to go that will actually make it a, a less of a burden on your machine um, to load everything into the timeline. So I think you probably want to Google that rather than ask me, honestly. Um, okay. Carrick asks, do you have any tips on making an editing reel? I think, you know, your editing reel should be scenes of stuff you've edited. I think a lot of editors tend to be like, make a really big montage. A really big montage is cool and maybe has a place on your reel, but you don't want your whole reel to be a montage. Because when you're uh, showing a montage on your reel, it's what's it showing? It's showing your ability to create a montage. But also, you want to show your ability to cut a scene, to create a mood, to whatever. And so I would have on your reel, you know, separate little sections that have the various things that you can do just so that I've seen editing reels that are just mostly montage. And it's like, okay, great. But I want to know, can you cut a scene? So make sure that you put that kind of stuff onto your reel as well. All right. Um, okay. I'm going to answer Greg's question. He says, I have a question. How many people do you usually collaborate on a single project with? I'm a senior AV producer and I'm expected to turn around video content shooting a drone audio in a week. Uh, you have a current project I don't have time to look at. It, it really just depends on the project, Greg, and how big it is and how, um, you know, how many moving pieces there are, how much footage there is, things like that. The bigger the project, the more people you want on it and you want clear and defined jobs. So you might, it sounds great, like you might want somebody like an assistant editor or junior editor, somebody that can help you manage the workflow. Uh, you know, we have, a, we have people here that go through our project, they pull the selects, they mark the takes, they get it to the point where, you know, I was showing how I'd organize my takes for this little skit. We have people that help out with that process just so that you're not always waiting on yourself to just do those things. You have somebody that's kind of laying the track ahead of you a little bit. I always tell my editors though, you know, just because the assistant has pulled the select takes together and put them in a spot for you, you cannot just rely on that those are the best. You gotta, sometimes you're going hunting and you need pieces and you gotta say, I'm gonna go back to the very, you know, the root, the raw footage and look what's there because an assistant or somebody might have just missed a, a usable piece. And so, you know, make sure that you still know all your footage really, really well. Um, okay, let's go to the next question. Uh, Bruno says, I noticed you are not using headphones. Using the computer audio have any advantage over using concealing headphones? Uh, Bruno, I do use headphones a lot. Uh, I will sort of do a mix of both. I do want to know how the audio sounds how most people are going to listen to it. And most people are not going to listen on headphones. So only using your headphones can give you kind of a, a, an incorrect idea of what it sounds like. But, you know, we work in a room with other editors often. And so I don't want to just be blaring sound at them. So you do listen on headphones sometimes. But I think in general, it's actually more advantageous to listen out of speakers. People are going to mostly be listening to it out of speakers, off the, out of their phone, in their car, at their home, off their computer. Most people don't listen to stuff uh, like, video content like game nights on their on headphones alias how are you alias is a game night i'm gonna answer her question what is one of your pet peeves in editing what is one of my pet peeves in editing i think uh when i'm sort of training or watching other people edit one of my big pet peeves is slow movement around the timeline just not being able to get where they want to get very quickly um that tends to make me a little bit frustrated because it feels like, hey, if you can't move in the timeline and the sequence right to where you wanna go really quickly, then it feels like it takes forever for you to do anything. And I think that's one thing everybody can learn is just getting really good at moving around the timeline and getting to where you wanna get, get. What's the, you know, if I know I wanna get to the start of that clip, how can I get there the fastest? That's why I love the TQ, the uh, TQ trick because it just gets you to places so fast in the timeline. So you're just like click TQ and you're there at the start of the clip and you can hit play. All right, um, answer, or sorry, question from Kale Randall asks, how do you deal with client 
feedback. Is the client always right? Or do you try to explain your thinking or does it depend on the situation? I imagine trailer work is super full of this. Well, I mean, you could probably talk for hours about how to deal with clients uh, when you're working in video. I think clients respect the editors and the creators the most that have a perspective and feel strongly about it. But you also have to realize that the client is the client and they get to say. And, and one thing I say to clients, or I used to when I was in trailers all the time, I don't have as many clients these days, uh, is that I would always be like, listen, I did what I did because I think it's better. I mean, if I, if I did, sometimes they say something like, I didn't even think of that. But a lot of times you're in a little bit of an argument with your client. You think something should go one way. They think the other. Um, a lot of times I'm like, you know, I'm going to do what you, I'm going to show you what, um, what it is that you're asking for. I don't like to just try and argue them out of it without ever looking at it. But sometimes you look at two things and they think something and you think something out else. And that happens a lot. And a lot of times I'm like, listen, here's why I think it. I feel strongly. I think this way is better, but you're the client. And I am, you know, I'm happy with the way this relationship works. If you want to override that, that's totally fine. I just want you to know that I had reasons for doing the thing. And this is why I think it's good. Um, but it's ultimately your decision. And I think that's a really good way to handle your client, which is just totally respectful. I get that you get to make the decision. You get to say, you know, ultimately what's good. But I also want you to know that like, I, when I show you stuff, I think, I, I think it's awesome. Right? I don't, I don't want to show you anything that I don't think is awesome. And I don't think they want an editor that's not going to show them things that they think are awesome, right? They, they will respect that about you. Just don't push you, so you can push back, you can fight. I mean, I've argued with the Edgar Wrights of the world, you know, I've argued with the studio heads, not argued, but I've said, I've stood up and said, listen, I get what you're saying, but I actually think this is better. And here's why. And it feels scary to do that in the moment, but actually makes them respect you more. They don't want just button pushers. They want somebody in the chair that's going to elevate the, th the content. And the person that's going to elevate the content is the person that is trying to make it good and will push back against you. All right. George Holy asks, when doing the surgery, how would you handle the mu music tracks? Aha, George, I like, to I like to say that music editing is one of the hardest things about editing. And most editors, when they get to a certain point, will worry about the music constantly. You will have to make a change and your brain will immediately go, but that is going to mess up all of my music, right? Everyone's probably felt that. Where it's like, oh, I want to do this thing. But if I do that, I, I struggled with the music so hard and it's going to mess it all up. I'll tell you, the best way to deal with it is don't worry about the music. Slice the music, move it, stitch it back up. And then once you've got the rest, go down in your music, re-edit it, re-edit your music. The more you struggle with the music, the more that you fight against the music, the more that you bend it to your will, the better you'll get at it. And you'll eventually get to the point where you don't even have that thought in your head about what it's going to do to your music. You'll just be like, yep, I'll fix the music after this. It'll be fine because you'll have done it so many times. Okay, uh, I think we've probably got time for one more question. Uh, let me, let's see, I'm looking for a question that's easy to answer. It's going to take so long to find one. Okay. All right, work life balance question from Johnny. How do you usually work before taking a break? How do you usually, I can usually only do two to three hours at a time without needing a break. Uh, I, I, I'm always sort of looking for the zone. So I do think breaks are great. Uh, distance from your, your project can help you a lot. So a lot of times I'll get to the point where I'm like, I think it's good. I'm going to go grab a drink, walk around the office, chat with somebody, come back and then look at it again and see if I still think it's great. Cause when you're in the midst of it, it can be hard, but you know, we all kind of look for those zones, I think as creators, and sometimes you just get in it. And when I'm in the zone, I like to like, I'm like, don't talk to me. I might sit here for six hours and, but I'm in the zone right now and everything's just clicking. And so I just think it depends on how I'm feeling at that moment. Cause I've been known to go for eight hours without looking up, but sometimes it's really tough and I feel like I'm banging my head against the wall. It can be great to just get up, take a walk around the block, you know, go grab a taco, whatever it is, and give yourself a little bit of, of a break. But when, man, when you're in the zone and it's clicking, stay in the zone, stay in the zone. Okay. We are going to have, yeah, mm, tacos. That's right, Caleb. All right, everybody. Emily has posted the survey into the chat pod. If you could please fill that out. It really does help Adobe uh, with these um, types of events in the future. I really appreciate everybody that stuck around and uh, hung out with us today. I hope that you learned some tricks and uh, some little tips that can help you for your next project. And uh, yeah, that's it. I hope I did okay. I, I can't go back and edit better versions of this later, so... <laughs> I was a little nervous. Thanks, everybody. That's really nice of you. Appreciate everybody for showing up. 
And uh, yeah, maybe we'll do this again sometime.